Yo! Oh, I'm on the mic. Okay. Do we have the uh, we have the live stream going? Is the live stream going? Yep. Okay. We'll go ahead and get started. Can everybody hear me? Okay. All right. Okay. Let's do this. Uh, for anybody who I, I haven't met, I'm Mark. Uh, I run product here. Um, over the next 45 minutes or so, we're going to be talking about agile um, development. Before we get started, um, let me first of all just say hello to people, our remote crew on the uh, watching the live stream um, from all across the country. Kind of cool. Um, if you want to ask a question, we want to make sure that the, the people on the remote campus can hear it. So if you have a question, just raise your hand, and Andrew, who's over there, will come and hand you the mic. Um, and then for the remote students, if you have a question, just post it in the Slack channel. Um, and Frida will read it out loud. Um, so, before we get started, has anyone here worked on an Agile team before? A few takers just did. Okay. Um, any brave souls want to take a stab at describing, in a nutshell, what Agile development is? No? Okay. All right. Well, you're about to find out. Um, Last question is, why is it so important to learn Agile? Anyone? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, because there's about 100% chance you'll be using it um, whoops, in your next job out of, out of full stack. Um, it's, boy, this battery is low. Let me, uh, let me put in a new battery here on this clicker. Stand by. Okay. All right, let's try this. Yeah, because you'll be using Agile on your next job. Okay. All right. So what we're going to talk about, um, first we're going to talk about life before Agile, and we're going to look at this thing called Waterfall, uh, which you may have heard of. Um, we're going to look at the Agile Manifesto. Um, we're going to look at how Agile uh, development works. Um, and we're going to specifically look at uh, two frameworks, Scrum and Kanban. And then we're going to show a, a real-world example of how we use it here at Full Stack. So let's dive in here. Um, waterfall. This is a visual representation of waterfall uh, development. Um, in fact, waterfall is so old that this unimpressive PowerPoint graphic is the best thing I could find on, on Google. Um, but, but this gives you the idea, right? There's, there's steps in, in, in terms of building a, a web project, a web app. Uh, analysis, design, implementation, testing, deployment, on through to maintenance. And that blue stuff is meant to be water, I suppose, flowing from one step uh, to the next. Uh, and this actually used to be the most popular method of, of software development for a, a long time. But, alas, what's wrong with this picture? Yeah. Flows only one way. Flows only one way. Good. Anyone else? Yeah. Uh, you do have to wait, right? So it's it's not very flexible going back and forth. Anyone else? Yeah. Right. And does that ever happen in the real world? 
No, that never happens in the real world. Okay, so um, to sum up here, it's, it's sequential. It's not easy to go back and forth. Um, you have to plan everything at the start. So you have to know all of your requirements at, up front and they can't change. And if one phase is delayed, then, then everything is. So there are actually some situations where waterfall works. So for example, if you, if you happen to find yourself building a 747, it, it'll work for you. Um, if you find yourself building a giant dam, it'll work for you. And the reason is these types of projects are huge engineering projects. And they're really based on physics, right? They're not going to change all that much from when you begin the project. Um, you're not really dealing with human users, in other words. But when you're dealing with humans, people who are using your product, the requirements will change because you'll put it in front of them, you'll iterate. Um, so unless you're building something big like this, you're probably not going to want to use waterfall. Unless, one other example, when it could work, is if you're working on a very small project. You know, something that's two, three, four weeks, then you can use waterfall, that's fine. Okay, now let's start looking at, at Agile. Has anyone heard of the Agile Manifesto before? Okay, we've got one Agile expert in the house. Okay. Um, I don't think they were up all night working on the front end design of this page, uh, but you'll get the sense for it. There's, there's essentially four components of the Agile Manifesto, which by the way, you can find at agilemanifesto.org. First one is individuals in interactions over processes and tools. Okay. Working software over comprehensive documentation. Used to be the opposite of that. People used to focus more on documentation. Agile says no. Uh, customer collaboration over contract negotiation. Okay, fine. And responding to change over, fo over following a plan. Okay, so these are the basic tenets of Agile, right? And these are sort of the themes that we'll be diving into over the next few minutes. There are some issues with Agile, and we'll be getting into those as well. I don't want to put uh, rose-colored glasses on. So I'm, I'm going to give you the good, the bad, and the ugly about Agile. So you can have an informed opinion and you can participate in the debate that you will no doubt see on Hacker News. Some people love Agile, some people don't. You may fall somewhere on that spectrum. By the way, as long as I'm on the subject of Hacker News, who here reads Hacker News? Okay, who reads it every day? Who reads it several times a day? Okay, you should all be reading Hacker News every day. Put it on your phone. When you check your Twitter, you check your Facebook, check Hacker News, right? That's your community. That's the global community of developers. That's YC's thing if, if, you, if you've never heard of Hacker News. Um, it's got a weird uh, URL, so just Google it. But make sure you check Hacker News and participate in that community. Uh, because, by the way, when you leave full stack and you're doing your interviews, your job interviews, you may get asked a question, hey, what'd you see on Hacker News that was cool today? So just get in the habit of reading it. Okay, how agile development, that's my rant done. Um, how agile development works. Um, let's look at Scrum first. And this is, uh, well, it's, it's still the most popular framework. Um, we'll see how much longer it's the most popular framework. Scr uh, Scrum board is the central organizing element of the Scrum workflow. And it's very simple here. This is an example of a Scrum board. You've no doubt, well, you've probably seen one of these before. So you've got four swim lanes, right? These are called swim lanes. Um, these white cards are just tickets. Scrum boards used to be literally on a wall with post-its before they came up with apps to do it. Um, and so each white card, think of it as like a post-it, and you move it, you, it progresses down the swim lanes from left to right. So it may start in the backlog, then it's ready, in progress, and then it's done. Very simple concept, right? Um, now, let's go up to the 30,000 foot view perspective and look at the Agile Scrum framework. Wow, this clicker is just uppity today. Okay, let me walk you through this, this bird's eye view, okay? Oh, maybe we'll, oh, look at that, getting fancy. Okay, um, so first you have your inputs from your, your stakeholders. Um, coming into the product owner, who's responsible for gathering all the inputs, they go into a backlog. We're gonna look more at the backlog. Uh, there's a sprint planning meeting where people uh, look through the backlog, prioritize the tickets they wanna work on. Tickets they wanna work in go to the backlog for that sprint. And then there's a one to four week sprint. Who can tell me the most common length of a sprint? Two weeks, yeah. One week uh, is too short. You're gonna be spending half your life planning and four weeks can get a little long. So two week sprints are pretty typical. 
Um, so people walk through the sprint every 24 hours, every day. There's a scrum meeting, a stand-up. Um, and then at the end, there's some finished work that comes out. Uh, there's a review, um, and then there's a retrospective. And we'll be talking about all of these different um, elements, um, and particularly the, the, the team members. So um, in fact, let's look at the, the team members next, right? The people who are involved in this process. First, there's the team. That's you guys. That's the engineers, OK? Um, then you have your product owner. And the product owner is responsible for a few things. First of all, representing the, the customer and the stakeholders. So they're essentially the, the, the voice of, of the customer. Um, they own and manage the backlog. Own and manage the backlog in terms of prioritizing items up to the top. Responsible for maximizing the value of the product. Maximizing the value of the product. And that's a concept I really like about, about Scrum. And making sure things are done right on, and on time. They own release management in terms of scheduling what's supposed to come out when. Um, and they work closely with and sometimes manage the Scrum team. All right, so that's the product owner. Now let's look at the Scrum master. Uh, the Scrum master is basically the person who's running uh, the process, the workflow. Uh, they make sure that the team is following that team's best practices and rules. It's usually not a full-time role. So you're not going to be hanging out at a bar one night and you meet somebody and you say, oh, what do you do? And they go, I'm a scrum master. Right? It's, not like a, it's not a job. Um, it's just a hat people wear. Sometimes it'll be a technical lead. Sometimes it'll be a product person. Somebody who's wearing They work as a servant leader for the team. So oftentimes, most times, um, the scrum master is not going to be your manager. Right? They're not going to be managing the engineers. Uh, in fact, if they're a good one, they should treat themselves as like a servant leader. Like they're helping to lead everybody. However, they're there to help you. They're help, there to help you do your job. I'm not going to get more onto that in a minute. Um, they also guard the engineers from external disruptions. So uh, has anyone ever heard the term context switching? No? A couple people. Right. If you haven't heard of it, you know what it is, right? Context switching is like, so imagine you're like really in the zone writing some piece of code, and somebody taps you on the shoulder and goes, hey, can you do this totally different thing? Right? It's just changing the subject. And that's expensive in terms of mental cycles. Right? It takes your time. Um, so you want people who get that and who are going to protect you from context uh, disruption so you can sort of stay in the zone, which helps maximize the productivity of the team. Right? And also remove impediments for the team. So if you're working on something and you need some endpoint to connect to and you can't get it, then you'll go to your scrum master and, and uh, hopefully that person can, can take care of those types of things. And also run scrum events, so your stand-ups and, and such. So you got your, your scrum master and your product owner. So question, should the scrum master and product owner be the same person? Who thinks yes? Who thinks no? Uh, OK, anybody want to take a stab at describing why? Yeah, good, good. And to paraphrase for the people who couldn't hear, uh, you know, it's essentially making sure that there's, there's no conflict of interest happening because the product manager may want something different from, from the engineers um, or the engineering team. Now, in, in practice, do you think that this is typically the same person or it's different people? Same person, different people. Okay, I think you guys are ready for your lunch. Um, OK, uh, it, it depends, right? So if you leave here and you, your next job is you go to work for some big company, you go work for American Express, right? Chances are it's going to be a different people. And that makes sense for conflict of, re conflict of interest reasons that you just described. However, if you go to work for a startup, maybe there's 10 people working there, it's probably going to be the same person. And that probably makes sense because that startup can move quicker uh, in that sense. And whenever I, I've done a few startups, uh, over the years, and I've actually, I typically like to be the scrum master and the product owner. Uh, because for me, 
Um, I don't like to have somebody in between me and the engineers. I like to think of we're kind of on the battlefield together. Um, I don't, I don't want to go through a gateway. However, in a bigger company, sometimes it makes sense. Okay, so now let's look at the, the backlog, some characteristics. So each ticket is a user story, right, quote unquote. Um, and there's a, there's a specific um, semantic format uh, to, the, to the tickets. As a blank, I want blank, so that blank, right? Um, all stories should add values, value for the customer. If they don't, they shouldn't be in the backlog. It's a general rule. Higher priority items are at the top, like I mentioned before. And the level of detail for each ticket depends on how close it is to the top. So tickets that are closer to the top of the backlog, you spent more time thinking about, they're higher priority, so you're going to have a higher level of detail on those tickets. And it's a living document, right? So it doesn't just sit there and that's it. It's, it's breathing every day. People are working on it, collaborating on it. It, it changes all day, every day. So a question for you, do Scrum teams really use this format for items in the backlog? By this format, I mean as a blank, I want blank, so that blank. Yeah. For the most part, yeah, right. So whenever you see as a blank, blank and you'll see that a lot, just know that's, that's scrummy, that's agile, right? Um, I, I kind of rarely see this, um, and sometimes it's, um, it's not in this format at all. Um, but just the as a blank, I want blank is, is pretty standard language. So for each uh, user story, when you click on it, you open it up, um, usually it's just going to be a, a ticket in GitHub or maybe some other ticketing system that people are using. But you open up the ticket, the issue, and it uses the same uh, format for acceptance criteria or AC. And these are just the list of tasks that, has to, that have to happen to, to enable that user story. So, for example, as a logged in user, I expect to be able to use my, to see my account settings. And you see another example there. So, you got your user story with a bunch of acceptance criteria in it. So, once the user story is prioritized in the backlog, the acceptance criteria are agreed, move on to the next stage, or the team moves on to the next stage, which is putting the wireframes together. So, before I get into this, does anybody recognize this app? Well, not, not YouTube, sorry, I should have been more specific. The, the actual wireframing app that we're seeing here. Balsamic, yeah. So, so uh, Balsamic is probably the most commonly used wireframing app. Um, it doesn't really matter what you use. You can just use a whiteboard and take a picture of it. As long as it uh, gets across the general idea of what this thing is, is supposed to do UI-wise. So Balsamic, most commonly used. Visio and InDesign. Also sometimes used a couple of free apps that you see there, Glyphian and Wireframe. Um, so then once the wireframes are done, you move on to the next stage, which is creating the mocks. Usually this will be the, the designer or the, or the front end developer. Um, co tools most commonly used for this, Photoshop, obviously. Keynote is very popular for putting mocks together. Can anybody tell me why Keynote is so popular for mocks? No? OK. The reason is, anybody heard the expression, fake it until you make it, right? So yeah, so you can just animate. It's very easy, simple animation tools in Keynote. So you can simulate when I click here, that happens. Um, and, and so that gives people not only a sense for what it's supposed to look like, but you know, sort of the, the UI components of it. Uh, there's an app called Sketch. Have you guys seen the, the CTO talk from Otter yet about design? Okay, I think that's coming up. He's great, by the way. You're really going to enjoy that one. Uh, Otter's a big fan of Sketch. Ske you can think of Sketch as sort of a combination between Photoshop and Illustrator. It's kind of got like, like bitmap and vector in it. Uh, a couple really good things about it. I, I should be a, a Sketch salesperson, by the way. Um, first of all, it only costs $99, right? So you're not going to pay 50 bucks a month or whatever it is for Adobe Creative Cloud. Um, uh, and it's just very easy to use. Like, you can get up and running on this in like an hour. Uh, and in fact, Sketch is getting more, and more so, so popular, especially for wireframing and mocks, um, that Adobe is starting to take notice because Sketch is starting to eat some of Adobe's lunch. And Sketch is a tiny little company, like 10 developers from Norway, I want to say. Uh, but anyway, Adobe sees what's going on, so now they've come out with their own uh, mock and wireframing tool called Adobe Comp. I haven't tried it out yet, um, but it's out. It's, I think it's in beta. Okay, so you got your user stories, your acceptance criteria, wireframes and mocks. Um, now let's talk about sprint planning. Okay? So each user story is estimated with 
story points. And story points are an estimate of the amount of work required to do that particular task, right? So you're seeing a sequence of numbers here. Anybody recognize this sequence of numbers? Any math geeks in the house? Fibonacci. Fibonacci, Fibonacci sequence. Uh, this is actually modified Fibonacci because it's got this number and, and that number. Um, but Fibonacci is the, the, number, the sequence um, of numbers that's most commonly used to estimate story points. And let me tell you why. Okay, before Fibonacci, people used Fibonacci. They used to use, believe it or not, like t-shirt sizes, small, medium, large, extra large. So then I think this was an upgrade um, uh, to that. The reason people like Fibonacci for estimating story points is because you can see as you get bigger, the delta between the numbers gets bigger. Uh, and the reason that is good with uh, estimating story points is because the bigger the task gets, um, the harder it is to estimate it, the amount of time required with any degree of certainty. So if, if, this, if you get asked this question in a job interview, what's a good way to estimate story points? You say Fibonacci. That's the answer they're looking for. Um, now, <coughs> th there's, a, there's a bit of an art and a science to estimating uh, tasks, right? Because let's face it, before you've done something, it's difficult to figure out how long it's going to take to do it. You may bump into some technical challenge. Who knows? So it's very difficult to estimate. And in fact, if you go onto Hacker News and you do a search for story points, um, there's no end of debate about should people even be doing story points? Or is that just a complete waste of time? Because they're always going to be just wild guesses, right? Um, and in fact, it's, it's gotten to such a degree that people are trying to solve the problem of this estimating story points with accuracy. And they've come up with this fairly convoluted, I believe, game uh, called Planning Poker. And I think, yeah, OK. Here's a deck of cards. This is some Planning Poker cards. And, and the way Planning poker, poker works is um, this is, let's say, there's, let's say it's a, a sprint planning meeting. This is a deck of cards. Each developer would be given this set of cards, the Fibonacci sequence. Um, and we would go around the room, right? And let's say I'm the scrum master. We're sitting down doing a planning meeting. This is the way the process would work. I would put a user story up on the screen. So for example, we're building a new web app. And the user story is, as a user, I want to be able to log in using a simple login page so that I can get started quickly. Everybody would read that. And then I'd say, OK, everybody ready to show me your card? And then everybody would show their card at the same time, infinity, OK, or eight. Which one is that? Um, and the idea here is that, let's say there's five engineers. If you all come up with the same answer, fine. Then that's the, that's the estimate. Everybody has the same feeling. That almost never happens, right? Um, so what will happen is, in terms of the process for planning poker, the person who put up the highest card and the person who put up the lowest card explain their logic. And then you go around again, and you do a vote uh, until everybody comes up with the same number. Now, what's the problem? What are you not doing when you're playing planning poker? Coding. <laughs> Writing code. Right, you're playing planning poker. OK. Um, problem number one. OK. But that's planning poker, so now you, you at least know how, how it works. When it comes to story points, there's also uh, something called velocity. And velocity, you know, if people are tracking story points, then they're also tracking the velocity of the team and the velocity of you as, as engineers. So uh, by velocity, I mean, let, let's say, actually, let me a slide aside here. You, you may think, looking at this, that the number one would be one hour. That would be a logical guess, right? Um, alas, it's not. It's specifically not by the Agile Manifesto uh, or the Scrum Lords. Um, they say, don't make the one equal to something simple like one hour. Um, they want you to make the one equal to the amount of time it takes you to build one simple little thing. For example, a modal. I'm already confused. Right? I don't understand why one can't just equal one hour. But anyway, th you need to assign what one story point is equal to. That's part of the process for the team. Um, but let's say, for simple math, right, that one story point is equal to one hour. Okay? And let's say that you are working on the engineering, engineering team full time, 40 hours a week, um, then your velocity as an engineer is 40 points per week. Let's say there's five of you engineers on the team. You're all working full time, so your team's velocity is 200 story points per week. Let's say it's a two-week sprint, so you've got 400 story points to work with. 
So the Scrum Master will look at that and say, all right, I got an available 400 points of engineering time, prioritize my backlog, I know how, how much each ticket takes, um, and then that's the sprint we're going to do. And then the velocity will get, will get tracked um, through something called a burn down chart, which we'll look at in a second. But that's basically how velocity works. Okay, there's also something called, like I mentioned before, a daily stand-up. If, if it's well run, it should be five minutes max, right? Everybody goes around, just says, yesterday I worked on, dot, 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 today I'm working on, and um, if I have any blockers, right? You don't go, in stand-ups, you don't go into any detail. If there's any discussion required, you just acknowledge, hey, we should talk about this, and you, you schedule time to talk about it after stand-up. Uh, Sometimes, sometimes you'll see, uh, I've done this, it's been pretty funny sometimes, um, a social contract as, as part of the Scrum workflow. Basically like, for example, one time we did it where everybody on the team agreed, if you're late for stand-up, you gotta buy Starbucks for everybody. So the stakes were high, right? Uh, so you have, you have a little fun with it, with the social contract. I guess in this one, if you were late to stand-up, you wear a, a tote bag of shame. Um, and by the way, you see this guy's wearing a high fashion t-shirt? Certified Scrum Master. All right, he's official. Okay. Um, all right, so there's another concept called definition of done, right? So it's pretty simple. Um, where, I'm not gonna go through this, but you see uh, you wanna precisely define what does it mean to be done with a task? Um, it, for a backlog item, for a sprint, or for, for a release, and you can see some examples there. Um, but so everybody should be on the same page in terms of what done means, right? Okay, so I just mentioned burn down charts, and you're not gonna be able to see this in the back of the room, um, but what you're seeing here is, uh, this is probably the most commonly used um, vis data visualization for, for Scrum workflows. So basically what you see here on the y-axis are, are story points, and on the x-axis, one day at a time, okay? So in this sprint, um, we started out with 52 or so story points to do, and by the end there should be zero remaining, and so you should see the, the line going down like that. Then, as you guys complete tickets, they go through code review, they get pushed live, the ticket is done, story points are completed, so this was one ticket that got pushed live, here's another one, and so forth. And so over time, that line should be trending down uh, to zero. Will there be burn down charts at your next job? Maybe. Um, I've, used, I've seen companies use them in crazy ways. Like, for example, if any of, any of you go to work for NBCs, engineering department, they've got about 100 en engineers out in Secaucus, I wanna say. Um, 100 engineers, if you can imagine, in rooms about the size of like the flex room over there, engineering teams. Um, in each room, there's a big flat screen TV with a burn down chart. So they're pretty hardcore about it, burn down chart in every room. Other companies don't have a burn down chart, don't even know what it is, right? But that's what a burn down chart is, um, in case you come across one. Okay, at the end of the sprint, there's sprint demos. These can be a lot of fun. Um, beer in hand, uh, or coffee, or beverage of choice, uh, or not. Um, but I kind of think of sprint demos as like show and tell. It's a great, you know, you do it on Friday around happy hour time. All the engineers can stand up and show what they built. It's, it's, uh, it's fun, right? But it, it's also a good way to keep everybody synced up in terms of different things that are, that are getting built. Uh, and then there's retrospectives um, at the end of every sprint. I think at this point you've done a, a retrospective or two, so you kind of know how these work. Um, but these are the three general questions for a retrospective. Um, what went well, what didn't, and what improvements could be made. Uh, and theoretically those improvements should be made in the next sprint. Okay, so now you guys are all experts at Agile. That wasn't too hard, right? Um, now, let's take a look at some apps. The apps that people use in the real world to manage Agile workflows. First one is called Jira. Anybody heard of Jira? Yeah, a few people? Okay, anybody heard of Atlassian? Okay, yeah, most of you. All right, so Atlassian is a unicorn, right? Um, they make um, Jira Agile, they make Bitbucket, they make, what, what else do they make? HipChat, um, they, they make, so, so basically uh, Bitbucket, if you don't know Bitbucket, it's Atlassian's not as good version of GitHub, right? HipChat is their not as good version as Slack, right? And Jira Agile, sorry guys, um, Jira Agile, I'm not a fan, right? Well, here's the thing. 
With Jira Agile, they're like the 800 pound gorilla in this space. They've got like an 80% market share. So you'll probably be using Jira Agile. Not necessarily a good thing. I, I think of Jira Agile as like the internet explorer of <laughs> Agile apps. It's just big and bloated and it's like you gotta figure it out. It should just be easy, right? Um, but you'll probably be using Jira Agile, sorry. Um, but you can see here, it's just basic sort of scrum board sort of a situation going on there. Um, and each ticket here is not linking to a GitHub ticket, it's linking to a, a Bitbucket ticket. The, the second most popular Agile app is called Pivotal Tracker, about a 20% market share. Um, I've never used it, so I don't have an opinion on it one way or the other. Um, it looks fairly scrum boardy to me, um, but haven't used it. Um, then there's a, a number of, of free or close to free apps um, that basically will take your GitHub repo and just put a, an agile scrum board GUI on top of it. For example, zenhub.io, Waffle, which is actually what we use in-house here. We like it. This is free. Um, um, and a matter of fact, if you go to the GitHub's integrations page, you'll see a bunch of different agile apps that sit on top of, of GitHub. Okay, you're seeing here, you probably can't read it at the back of the room, but there's, there's two organizations here, the Scrum Alliance and the International Scrum Institute, okay? Um, and for the low, low price of $1,000 and a full weekend, all day Saturday and all day Sunday of your time, you can learn Scrum in Agile. Who thinks this is a good idea? No takers? All right, good. Don't do this. Don't do this. If, if your employer wants to send you on this, you know, just to check a box, fine. But uh, you've just learned it, right? Could you imagine spending it a full weekend learning what you just learned in, in 20 minutes? Um, you get a cool t-shirt. Depends how cool it is, right? I suppose. Um, yeah, look at the t-shirt before you sign up. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, so don't do that. Okay. So that's, that's Scrum. Okay, now let's look at Kanban, right? So, Kanban. So if you can look at Scrum. Scrum is, is time bound, right? So there's, there's two week um, sprints, right? Kanban is not time bound. It's just like an ongoing assembly line of work. So there's a backlog, yes. There's a, a Scrum board. In this case, technically it's called a Kanban board, but everybody still calls it a Scrum board. Um, there's no sprints and no sprint planning, right? Because it's not time bound. There's no story points. There are no daily stand ups. And there are no sprint demos or retrospectives. Okay? So it's just an assembly line of, of tickets working, working down, the, down the scrum board. Now, I know I mentioned at the beginning of the talk that there were two, type, two frameworks of Agile Scrum and Kanban. But surprise, there's a third, and it's a hybrid of these two. Can anybody guess what it's called? Scrumbon. Scrumbon. <laughs> yeah, good. Very good. <laughs> Scrumbon, yeah, okay. Um, now, the difference with Scrumbon is um, it's, it's the same as Kanban, except um, there are daily stand-ups, there are engineering demos, and there are retrospectives. Okay, and so, so Scrumbon is relatively new. It's only in the last, I don't know, year or so um, that people have been using it, and it's becoming more and more popular for reasons I'll go, to, go into in a few minutes. So where was I? Oh, did I just, whoops. Okay, so that's how Agile works, right? Scrum, Kanban, and Scrumbon. It's not, it's not rocket science. So let's look at a real world example how we use it here, okay? Here's a bit of a spoiler. Okay, so we've got our engineering team, full stack engineering team, um, and we run the team using, anyone? 
Scrum bot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we used Scrum um, and we switched over to Scrum on probably about a year or so ago as an experiment. Um, and we never looked back um, because what we found is, you know, it was an experiment. So, so what I expected to see was the velocity of the team go down um, because, A, we weren't tracking it anymore because we weren't doing story points anymore. So you actually can't even track velocity, right? Um, but that was just sort of my hunch, my hypothesis going into it. What I found was the opposite. The velocity went up, even though I can't quantify it with story points, right? But we were, putting, we were releasing more software, faster, better. Uh, most importantly for the engineers, the engineers were happier because they didn't have to do story points. They didn't have to do sprint planning. They didn't have to do poker planning. All that time, they're just writing code. They can be focused on the task at hand. So Scrumbon works great for us. It's not for every organization. It just happens to work for us, right? And I guess that's one of the, the things about Agile, right? You're supposed to be Agile with it and, and craft it to whatever works for your, for your particular team. Scrumbon works for us. Um, in terms of the team, um, we've got uh, the business owners. The stakeholders are the most important people, the equation. That's you guys and people who are planning on coming to full stack, trying to get in. Um, I'm the product owner and the product manager, as I mentioned before. Um, and then we've got our engineering team in-house um, and our fellows. So this is all um, the, the, how the engineering team is, is set up. Now I mentioned that we use Waffle. Um, this is a screenshot of our scrum board. You're not going to be able to see any of the details, right? So I will, um, I will walk you through what's happening here. And the first thing you'll probably notice is, wow, there's a lot of swim lanes there. Yeah, um, there are. Uh, and that just happens to work for us just because of our, our workflow, the way we've got things up. Uh, but essentially, the, f the way we've set this up is we've got an inbox here. So anybody who has an idea, they just put it into GitHub, it goes into the inbox. Or if any of you have gone into Learn. Um, and there's a button that says re report a bug or something. There's a couple different buttons where you can get feedback. If you, if you put that in, it goes into the inbox for review. Um, what you're seeing here, this swim lane, which is closed, that says backlog. And there's usually about three or 400 tickets um, in the backlog. I could click, this is one of the things I like about Waffle, I could just click here to expand that and see all the tickets. Um, so that's the backlog. So when we pull tickets out of the backlog, um, first we design mocks. Um, once those are done, we write the engineering notes. Th these all go into the tickets so you can see, you, well, you probably can't see it, but this is like, this is a ticket. You can click here, this is GitHub ticket number 2736, right? Um, then the, the code gets written, then it goes into three different stages of review. <coughs> you won't be surprised. We're pretty strict about code review here. Um, so there's a design review uh, to make sure that the ticket uh, completes all the, uh, you know, matches the design spec. Uh, there's a product review uh, where I'll look at it or somebody else will look at it to make sure all the acceptance criteria are, are checked off. Uh, once both of those are done, it'll go into code review. Uh, and then any comments will just get marked right on the pull request and it'll go back and forth until it's done um, and then it'll get deployed. And we deploy you know, several times a day, typically. Okay. Um, we do do daily stand-ups. You've probably seen them on 25th floor or 11th floor fellows getting together for, for stand-ups. We do engineering demos every three weeks or so. Uh, we do retrospectives, not um, religiously, right? Um, the, the engineering team run ticks over pretty well, so we don't have to course correct too often. Uh, but we do retrospectives when it makes sense. No story points. That's why everybody loves working here. Um, OK. This clicker. Putting hurt on me. Okay, so that's the talk, right? And I'm going to sum up, and I'm going to I'm going to give you some some tips here. Um, but we've looked at li life before agile. We've looked at the agile manifesto, how agile development works, and we've looked at a real world example. So let me let me just sum all this up, right? So you can get on onto lunch. Okay, so real world agile experience is going to be really valuable when you take your first job after after full stack, right? So that, that puts an obvious uh, question out there, but before I get to that question, um, employers will expect you to know how to work on an Agile Scrum team. They'll just expect it, right? Um, meaning you'll be able to jump right into their, to their team and hit the ground running along with the rest of their, their team, okay? Therefore, knowing how to work Agile will make you more attractive to employers. 
So get some experience if possible. Easy to say, harder to do, right? So how do you actually do that? I'm going to give you a couple tips. Uh, first, uh, there's a video here. And, I, and we're going to slack out the, the slides afterwards as a link. Um, this is the product manager from who runs Jira Agile. Um, this is actually a really good talk. I think it's about an hour. Um, where he covers a lot of the same material we've just covered, but he also does, does a deep dive demo into Jira Agile, which is good for you to see, just to see how it works. Definitely recommend um, watching this video. Um, there's a great re article here about this sort of trend, um, people moving from Scrum to Kanban or to Scrumbon, and it's great to sort of understand um, sort of the, the zeitgeist, if you will, where, where people are trending uh, on this. Um, you can also run your life agile for a week. And this is something that actually the guy from Atlassian recommends. I think it's a great idea. Don't do it now. Okay. You guys are a little busy right now. But do it after you graduate, right? And, and the idea here is that with Jira Agile, you can get a free trial for seven days, right? So whatever you're using to manage your life, Google Calendar or whatever, go cold turkey, right? And manage your own life, Agile. Okay? And by doing that for a week, it'll do two things. Number one, uh, well, three things. Number one, you'll understand Agile. Like it, the, the, the concepts will really get reinforced. Number two, you'll understand how Jira works, right? Um, and number three, you'll probably form an opinion on Agile one way or the other. You may be starting to form an opinion, but you'll, you'll have a better sense for what your, what your opinion is uh, on it. Uh, and by the way, as long as we're on the subject of opinion, when you go into your job interviews um, and they ask you and Agile comes up, one thing that I wouldn't do is be super opinionated, right? Because Agile, it's like, it's like asking people, you know, what's better, the Stones or the Beatles? Jay-Z or Kanye, right? There's no right answer. It's just your opinion, right? So because people are so polarized on this topic, a smarter thing to do rather than saying, yeah, Agile's great or it sucks, um, is to just ask smart questions. Like, are you using Agile? Using Scrum or Kanban? Using story points? So you get across the message that you kind of know the lingo and the lay of the land, but don't be too opinionated because their opinion may be the opposite. OK, we just covered this one. And your capstone project. You start those like next week, I want to say? Yeah, OK, this is a perfect opportunity um, to run your capstone, proje capstone project as an Agile team, right? Don't go crazy. Don't have like 12 swim lanes like we do. Just have the very, very, the very simple ones, right? Um, and so set up a very, very basic Scrum board. Um, use Waffle. Put it right on top of your GitHub repo. It's all free. Um, and run daily stand-ups and have somebody you know, run the stand-ups. It's a great way to just sort of, own, sort of own the workflow and the concepts here. And then a little hack is after you graduate, no doubt, because you guys are all so smart, you're going to take the three videos that are going to be made of you while you're at full stack. Uh, you're going to put those on your LinkedIn profile, right? Because it looks great. Um, and what I would do is for your capstone project, just mention that you ran at Agile. Um, in terms of learning Sketch, I also definitely recommend this. Bit of a tangent here, but as long as I've got you, I definitely recommend learning Sketch if you don't know it. Just invest an hour or so to get the concepts. So whenever you've got concepts in your head, you'll just be able to use this as like a power tool to, to put pen to paper for your ideas. Envision. What's that? Envision. 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 Oh, it's the new keynote. OK. Well, it, does Envision, they have something to do with Sketch. Like you can. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And it, they're in bed with Sketch, right? So you can design it in Sketch, and then you can make it interactive in a vision, and then send people a link so they can, yeah. Yep. Good tip. Um, and some good articles um, to read here. You see the names uh, there. And again, they'll be, they'll be linked in the slides. So that's it. Any, any questions or comments? All right, lunchtime. Thanks, guys.